Uh, so good morning, everyone. As he just introduced, I'm Taylor Candler, and I'm one of the PGY1s. And my topic today is uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion and workplace discrimination. I just want to say thank you to Dr. Chu, who is my faculty supervisor on this project. Um, I'm very grateful for your support throughout the way. And I also want to just say thank you to my fellow co-residents and the various staff members who actually reached out to me since the topic was released last week. A lot of them reminded me on the importance of this talk and even provided a lot of additional resources. So thank you for that. And lastly, thank you to everybody being here today who's willing to listen and being willing to engage on an important topic. And just to preface this talk, I just want to mention that I am no expert in this topic. However, being a female urology resident, I think it does place me within that cultural shift. And throughout my own experiences and the experience of my exceptional colleagues and many of them friends, um, I just don't think I could have thought of a more timely topic that could only improve our workplace. So in terms of what we'll be learning today, so I'll give you some background information on why this topic and why it's important to talk about today. A little bit about EDI in urology in specific, talk about the importance of EDI broadly, talking about workplace uh, discrimination for residents in particular, and how we can make improvements in our workplace. So why this topic? So in urology, not only nationally, but globally, we're aware of the shift in the culture. We are seeing more women, religious representation, people of color, individuals who identify as LGBTQ, and those who have visible and invisible disabilities becoming more part of our workplace. And if we increase the diversity in our workplace without creating a safer and supportive environment, rates of discrimination and workplace harassment will undoubtedly increase. The reality is, is that discrimination is widespread within our workplace with very little recourse. And as a white woman, I certainly cannot speak to the profound effects that discrimination on the basis of race, religion, or ethnicity has. However, I can speak towards my own experience with sexism, sexual harassment, and ableism in medicine. And ultimately, if we don't talk about this topic, then there really isn't an opportunity to create a safer place for medical students, residents, and staff. So some ground rules. I think it's important to mention that when I was an incoming R1 almost a year ago now, I actually think it was Alec who mentioned something along the lines of, if something is making you feel really uncomfortable, just go and see it. And even if you don't do something about it, at least you'll learn something. And I think that very same knowledge applies here. If something makes you deeply uncomfortable, especially if it's a societal issue, it probably means that you need to learn a little bit more about it and probably lean into that discomfort. And as Dr. Chu said, kind of starting this all off, I think this topic makes us all a little bit uncomfortable. I know it was very difficult for me to kind of grapple with bringing this as a PGY1 to Grand Rounds, but my hope for this presentation and that it does just provide a platform for the topic and ultimately provides a safe space for dialogue, sharing our experiences and asking some tough questions. And in no way is this presentation to evoke shame or guilt, and it shouldn't take away from the sentiment that everybody in this program and in this job has challenges in their workplace, but it's to highlight that our challenges are different. And lastly, I just want to acknowledge before we get really started is that it's a difficult conversation, and especially for those who have been targeted by discriminatory actions. And so I just want to be cognizant as we move forward in the presentation that we're aware of each other's experiences as we learn today. So in a lot of ground round presentations that I've seen, it kind of starts off with an introduction, learning objectives, and then some sort of case-based approach that helps you anchor yourself throughout the presentation. I'm going to kind of change it up a little bit from this, and I will not present a case, but an accumulation of the experiences of the female urology residents in this program. I encourage you as we move throughout the next couple of slides and throughout the rest of the presentation that you keep this in mind as we kind of move through and learn. So these are statements that have been said to the five urology residents in our program. And given that we're all R1s to R3, all of these statements have actually been made during our foundational years of residency. And again, as I move through them, take some time on to reflect on what they would mean to you. Just to clarify to Taylor, you mean five female residents, correct? Yes, correct, yeah.
So here we see belittling and undermining comments. In this one, it's a frankly racist comment. Sexual harassment is not uncommon. So if these are not the common language that you hear every day at work or even weekly at work, I hope this is illuminating for some of the common experiences by people in our program. So now getting into EDI. So just a couple of terms to clarify before we get started. So equity is treating others fairly and giving everybody the same opportunities. And this differs from equality. A metaphor that I've often heard in this is that equity is giving somebody a pair of shoes that actually fits, where equality is giving everybody a pair of shoes. Diversity is ensuring that multiple identities are represented in organizations. And inclusion is really thoughts, ideas, and perspectives of everybody matters. As we are probably aware of, discrimination is unjust treatment of people based on their characteristics, such as race or gender. This can be unspoken or spoken or even buried within policy and legislation, whereas harassment is a little bit more actionable and behavioral. And then burnout is a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion caused by prolonged exposures to that stressor. It can range from fatigue, irritability, to medical error. And we know that it requires a multifaceted approach to prevention and recovery, and this includes access to self-care, access to help, and policies at organizational levels to ensure that the well-being of individuals. So the predominance of the talk on EDI will be about women in urology. For us, it's the largest minority in our program and has the most data. As a white person, I'm certainly not the best person to be speaking towards the BIPOC experience in surgery. However, I will briefly talk, touch upon um, those who are BIPOC, those who identify as LGBTQ, those with disabilities, and their experience in surgery and as patients. And I think it's also important to remember here intersectionality, that some people belong to multiple or all of these categories, and how that their experience can differ from others. So women in urology. So to start off, I'll talk about the foundational years of becoming a doctor, so starting with medical school. So depending on the resource, between 56 and 65% of medical students are now female. This stat kind of differs because depending on the resource you're looking at, it either looks at the overall total body of medical students versus the incoming year, knowing that the incoming year are often higher on that um, 65% comparatively to the overall student body. The CMA in 2019 stated that 56% overall were female, um, whereas in 2019, the U.S. was about 51% female. And looking at a more recent stat, so from UBC, the incoming class of 2021 was 63% female and 37% male, and less than 1% being non-binary or trans. So what this demonstrates is that clearly there is this uh, increase in the proportion of women in medical school. So in speaking in terms of EDI, the greater proportion of number of females is not equality. Equality would have meant 50-50 and less than 1% being trans or non-binary. And this would be reflective of the general population. However, if we're speaking in terms of equity, we know that there is a 60-40 male to female staff ratio, which is reflective that medical schools are actually reaching near parity. And well, we know this because there was not parity in medical schools until about 20, uh, 2008 to 2010, according to the AAMC. So in this context, equity would suggest that having a higher proportion of females in medical schools would equate to resolving the gender disparity sooner than equality. So at the end of medical school, as we know, we apply to residency and just a couple comments on what it looks like for medical students and particularly female medical students applying for residency. Though the CMAJ has an interesting paper from 2017 that looks at the applicants of gender and matching. So interestingly, and not really surprisingly, is that women actually match to their first choice in subspecialties such as family medicine over males. However, men are much more likely to match their first choice in surgical specialties over females. In addition, there is a study in neurosurgery between 1990 and 2007 that showed that females were significantly less likely to match over males. 
um, even after they're adjusted for co-founders, such as U.S. licensing exams, as well as medical school rank. And although these are not urology specific, there is data to support that surgical subspecialties that are still male dominated, such as neurosurgery, orthopedics, and urology are much less favorable towards women, whereas programs like general surgery and uh, family medicine um, are more favorable in terms of women matching. So in terms of residents, so urology obviously is still male dominated as a whole. Um, in 2018, Dr. Cox from Dalhousie published a paper called Trends in the Training of Female Urology Residents in Canada. So number one, they found an increase in the number of female applicants to urology, and they also found an increase in the success of these matches to urology. However, it wasn't statistically significant, but this is probably due to the small sample size in Canada. They also found that in the cohort from 2012 to 2015, that about 25% of residents across Canada were female. And ultimately, when you're in residency, you have to think of what kind of challenges that female urology residents experience and how does that possibly differ from our male colleagues. So a paper that I read from 2017 by um, Finlander et al. is called A Survey of Women Urology Residents Regarding Their Career Choice and Practicing Challenges, which I found quite interesting. So it was basically a survey that was given out to 91 female residents in the U.S. across multiple sites, and four main overall chain kind of challenges were found. So number one is gender-based discrimination, where over 50% reported gender-based discrimination from patients, colleagues, or superior staff. This discrimination kind of ranged from being ignored or being dismissed during rounds to actually being questioned about their abilities and qualifications. Number two, the lack of gender concordant mentorship, basically having difficulty to have access to female mentors, female staff <laughs> neurology, and particularly in subspecialties such as oncology. Number three, difficulties with work-life balance, including family planning, as well as a general lack of free time to participate in self-care. And number four, bias in training. So some respondents reported that they were not receiving the same opportunities or the same recognition as their male colleagues. And they also felt that they were being evaluated differently. So obviously the last one is concerning as a resident. So I looked a little bit deeper into that and Julie Wong actually shared some papers that she had uh, kind of saved up. So thanks to Julie for uh, providing these to me. In the sake of time, I won't delve too deep into them, but I'll kind of talk about the two that I found most interesting. So the first study was from 2017 and it's actually in the setting of thoracic surgery at two different US uh, academic centers. It was a cross-sectional survey um, where they looked at operative autonomy me measuring using the Zwitch scale. So the sample size was 33, 18 of that or 18% of that being female. There are 48 staff evaluators and 12 of those were female. In multivariate analysis, only case difficulty, resident gender, and level of training were significantly related to autonomy granted to residents. In this paper, they concluded that female residents were given significantly less autonomy than their male counterparts, and the perception of lack of autonomy was even more pronounced for women. In the second study, this was published in 2000, or 2022 by um, Olende et al. from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and the study was actually specific to urology. Um, I didn't find the actual study design very straightforward, and it was really difficult to understand how they were evaluating their residents, but they stated that they were assessing based on autonomy, performance, and complexity. There are 18 residents, four were female, 20 staff, and six were female. So overall, this center found that self-reporting amongst females and males did not differ significantly. And additionally, they did not receive any real differences in terms of autonomy and performance rating by both female and male staff. The interesting part is that in their conclusion uh, and in the discussion, they really did kind of harp on the fact that this is institutional only and that it's really likely due to their institutional culture as well as educational um, strategies between faculty and residents, um, which probably contributed to the positive outcome. Uh, and lastly, um, at the end of residency, we moved towards fellowships. And Dr. Cox's paper also identifies that urogynecology, reconstructive urology, pediatrics, and community general practice were most common for female residents. However, more research really needs to be done to assess why this is, and if it's really just a lack of female leadership and mentorship in the other uh, urological subspecialties. So moving on to staff. 
So in general, so women make up about 10 to 11 percent of urologists in both Canada and the U.S. Most of the stats here are going to be from U.S. sources, as there is a, not very much literature at all available in Canada. But there are some things that I think do apply here locally. Number one being the lack of representation in academic settings, such as what we see here at UBC. In the U.S., only about 6% of urology, chair, urology chairs uh, are women. In addition, a number of studies document a significant delay in academic promotion for female urologists over their male counterparts with seminal, similar credentials. And this was no, notably published by um, Byer et al. in Urology 2020. In terms of the gender pay gap, so this is not at all a talk about gender pay gap. That would be a massive undertaking here. So I'm going to leave it short. But basically, female physicians make make less than males in every medical subspecialty, and the gender pay gap in urology is well documented. In 2017, North et al. examined the AUA census data from 2016 and confirmed that men are twice as likely to make over 350000 as women, despite similar hours worked. In a separate survey, uh, Spencer et al. looked at 848 urologists and found that with confounding for factors including work hours, call frequency, age, um, practice setting, fellowship training, and practitioner support, female urologist salaries were 76,000 less than men. And in terms of burnout, I think this is a really important component of it um, and really interesting data out of Canada comparatively to other nations. So a paper published in 2021 by Dr. Chan et al. from Western University surveyed 93 women out of uh, 609 urologists. They used the McIlosh uh, burnout inventory and they asked questions and risk factors about burnout. Although the study by no means was perfect, it did identify that female urologists report higher levels of burnout than their male colleagues. And what makes this interesting is the analysis from the census of uh, the AUA from 2016 was that gender was not associated with burnout for American urologists. And similarly, female gender was not associated with burnout in studies done in Ireland as well as the United Kingdom. In summary, kind of beyond the female gender, burnout is associated with early career and financial strain. And interestingly, found in Canada is that subspecialties were not associated with burnout. However, the AUA states that general urology was a risk factor for burnout, whereas pediatrics and oncology were actually protective. So briefly touching on these other topics. So in general, there is very little data in Canada talking about BIPOC, LGBTQ, and disabilities um, here locally. I couldn't really find much information on any of them. A few things that I did find was that in 2020, there was only one Black urology resident across all 13 programs, and I couldn't find any statistics on what percent of consulting staff identifies Black. Uh, the largest ever acceptance of Black medical students across ca uh, Canada was in the class of 2024, and this was 24 out of the 259 admitted medical students. So there's a lot of um, information online, especially through the AUA, on Black and Hispanic people for medical school, as well as residency matching and for urology programs in general. This states, basically in summary, that we're not making any significant improvements in achieving equality for these groups. Again, it's very hard in Canada to find any information regarding Indigenous urologists or Indigenous um, identifying uh, residents, and the same goes for those who are LGBTQ in Canada. It is noted that in the most recent match, so 2023, um, the U.S. did have about two um, people who identified as non-binary and two who had transgender. So as of 2021, they are starting to collect that data. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll have more information about that. So reverse discrimination. So this is a topic that I want to briefly touch upon. Again, it could be an entire talk on its own. But really, there is a great article by the AUA. It's written by Dr. Justin Hans and Larissa Bresler, both urologists in the US. It was actually just posted a few days ago uh, on April 6. It's called Diversity, Myths, Fears, and the State of the Diversity in the United States Workforce. It starts off with a quote on the screen. And I think importantly, it talks about the phenomena of reverse discrimination. 
If you don't know, reverse discrimination is defined as the practice or policy of favoring individuals belonging to a group that have been previously discriminated against. And I think this is a well-known fear. There's papers written that were back from 1979 in medical literature, even before the proportion of women in medicine was less than 20%, and the proportion of BIPOC and those who outly identify as LGBTQ was abysmal. I think to sum it up, it's best from a quote by Dr. Nagy um, from the University of Toronto, who wrote a very insightful commentary on Black representation in urology. So basically, we exist on a spectrum of privilege. It's incumbent on each and every one of us to recognize the privilege, reflect on it, and use it to level the playing field for future urologists. I cannot continue to fall upon the shoulders of Blacks or other colleagues to dismantle systems that have kept them from joining us in our common cause. We owe it to our colleagues and to our patients to be the ones that bear that burden. So in summary, to dismantle reverse discrimination requires a lot more from moving away from scarcity thinking to de deliberately analyzing the many ways that our system is meant for discriminating against those uh, who previously uh, do not have the same uh, social barriers as others. So why does this matter? So I think we kind of summarized a lot for healthcare workers, including residents and staff. We're less likely to have applicants that are underrepresented apply. We're going to lose a lot of talented people to other subspecialties, such as general surgery, who typically have better uh, representation involved in their residency and staff. Uh, numbers. In terms of residents, we have less mentorship. It creates a skewed fellowship demographic towards urogynecology, etc. We have increased burnout for female urology residents. And for staff, you have to deal with the, pen, the gender pay gap, increased uh, uh, numbers of burnout, less work satisfaction and fulfillment, career alterations, as well as less involvement in academics and in leadership positions. And why does this matter for patients? So I think here is probably important to mention the landmark trial published in 2022 by in JAMA um, from data from Ontario from 2007 to uh, 2015 by Wallace et al. So this study um, just published last year looked at 1.3 million patients treated by nearly 3,000 surgeons in Ontario. When they looked at sex discordance between surgeons and patients and to assess for post-operative outcomes, including death. Again, due to the expansiveness of this talk, I won't go into too much detail, but overall, they found that sex discordance between surgeon and patient was associated with a significant increase in the likelihood of post-operative outcomes, including complications and death, however, not readmission to hospital. So while associations were consistent across most subgroups, and subgroups being the different types of um, concordance, so male, female, female, male, patient to surgeon, Patient sex was significantly modif um, modified this uh, assumption, which basically means that there was worse outcomes for female patients being treated by male surgeons. And this was compared to female patients being treated by female surgeons, but not by male patients being treated by female surgeons. So essentially what we can infer here is that there are worse outcomes for female patients being treated by male surgeons. However, the reverse corresponding association is not true when male patients are being treated by female surgeons. So from all this, I think we can infer that it's in the best benefit of our female patients to ensure that they have at least have access to female surgeons. When you think about this kind of on a larger scale, there is a lot of well-established data to say in general surgery, OB-GYN, thoracics, that race concordance also has improved outcomes. And this tells us that representation of all types is important to outcomes of patients. So workplace discrimination. So this is kind of the last big section of the present. Can I ask a question there, Taylor, since uh, sure. this is something when you interpret data, especially data that is uh, collected in a non-controlled manner, retrospectively gathered, you have to be careful with the term inference, right? It allows you to create a hypothesis, right? not necessarily an inference. Okay. And especially yeah. when some of your initial data may not be congruent. For example, the reverse of a group of uh, uh, where men looked at by females don't have the same correlation as you know female patients looked at or by male patients. So, so how would you address that issue? I mean, is it 
still appropriate to use the word infer, or is it more appropriate to use the term hypothesize? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure which one would be more appropriate here. I think we can make the inference from that paper that when female patients are looked after by male surgeons, that there is worse outcomes. I'm not sure, like you said, that you can say the reverse unless we did a more of a prospective study that looked at that more particular uh, and looked at that research question. Yeah. And we're applied scientists in medicine, right? So you, when you look at data across the spectrum of data, including the social sciences, I think that it's important to you know have a bar for how we use that data uh, from a... Um, um, but from a inference point of view, because it does, you know, the weight of how we interpret that data uh, should uh, reflect, uh, you know, the complexities and confoundations of its origins. So that's yeah. my, my my issue there, or my my point. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for mentioning that. Um, so. Moving on to workplace discrimination. So this entire presentation um, was really inspired actually by a paper that I read back in Surgical Foundations from Who et al. in 2019. So this paper was released um, in 2019, but it surveyed all U.S. general surgery residents from 2018. And the authors here sought to investigate the prevalence and types of discrimination, abuse, harassment, and burnout experienced by all surgical residents in the U.S., as well as their perceptions to institutional responses to the issue. So in terms of study design, so it was a survey deployed to all general surgery residents. The data was de-identified and then analyzed. And they looked at the main categories of mistreatment, including race, gender, pregnancy and childcare, sexual harassment, and then physical and verbal abuse. They had some ex exclusion criteria, of course, often kind of talking about um, residents who were clinically inactive, uh, residency programs that had no females involved, residency programs that had less than um, one resident per year, um, and those who violated the 80-hour workweek rule. In addition, so the kind of two main outcomes from this study was symptoms of burnout as well as suicidal thoughts. So in terms of demographic breakdown, so this was actually quite incredible that 99% of uh, surgical residents actually completed uh, this survey. And then the breakdown really equated to about 60% male and 40% female. Most individuals were in their PGY two to three years. Most were married or in a relationship and most were uh, located at, at an academic center. So in terms of results, so 38% of residents experienced symptoms of burnout weekly, 4.5% of residents experienced suicidal thoughts in the past year, and importantly, the general population is actually 2 to 3%, so residents experienced almost double the suicidal thoughts as the general population. In terms of burnout, risk factors that were associated with it was PGY1, especially compared to PGY4 or PGY5. Uh, violations of the 80-hour work week, mistreatment, and the amount of exposure to mistreatment based on race, gender, sexuality, or family planning. And then in terms of suicidal thoughts, so risk factors associated include increased exposure to mistreatment, those who are single, widowed, or divorced, as well as the female gender. Interestingly, when you take burnout and suicidal thoughts, um, if you confound for the fact that women actually report this higher, then the rates of burnout and suicidality were the same across both genders. So to me, table number three was most interesting and what I wanted to highlight and what I learned the most from um, during this research. So basically, this table breaks down the type of mistreatment and the source of mistreatment to kind of identify where these sources are coming from. So if we take gender discrimination, so overall, 32% of residents reported gender discrimination. However, 65% of women reported gender discrimination. So if you actually look at the breakdown of where this comes from, it actually states that patients and their families account for about 50% of where females think that the greatest source is coming from. And this differs from men. So if you actually kind of look down, gender discrimination from the perspective of the male respondents was actually about 30% from attendings. 
And then you can kind of look further down at the breakdown. So for women, next comes in line would be nursing staff and then followed by attendings. And for men, highs being attendings, then source not identified, and then patients and families. So slightly different depending on which gender you're looking at. In terms of racial uh, discrimination, 17% overall uh, reported uh, racial discrimination. The highest for men and women were both patients and families being the source. Men overall did report higher amounts of racial discrimination from attending staff comparatively to women. When you look at verbal or emotional abuse, so 30% reported this, the most frequent a source being attendings at about 50% for both genders, followed by co-residents actually at 20% for both genders. And when we look at sexual harassment, 10% reported this. However, when you look at the female uh, statistics, it was actually 19.9%. Uh, and for women, it was about 30% from families and, fr and patients, and then 30% from attendings. Men reported similar numbers for each source. However, the highest uh, report for men was actually in the nursing category, um, being around 23%. And then lastly, in terms of discrimination against those who have pregnancies or in terms of childcare, it was less than 7% overall reported this, um, but women did report it almost twice as much as men. And for women, the most common experience was from their staff and co-residents. And for men, it was similar. However, a much higher per uh, percentage was from um, an unknown source or not reported source. So I think importantly, the study concluded that they found mistreatment occurs frequently among general surgery residents, especially for women, and it is associated with burnout and suicidal thoughts. So in terms of improvements, so you've probably seen similar models to this in the past. We often use uh, these types of models when we're talking about systemically ingrained issues such as racism. It's kind of a top-down approach. So looking at policy and government actions to help improve the playing field, such as affirmative action or seat allocation. Then you kind of move a little bit smaller towards your own institution or your own programs, faculty, and then to the individual level. For the purpose of this talk, I'll kind of focus more on the program level as well as the individual because that's where the people in this room kind of lay. So in terms of how can the UBC urology program improve and support the residents? So we do have reporting systems through UBC, through RDBC, and internally in urology, we also have a panic button for residents. However, it's been my understanding throughout many talks upon wellness is that these are often more geared towards staff. Um, and we know from the previous study that we just talked about is that a lot of the sources of discrimination come from patients and nursing and allied health. And to be honest, we do need a better way to report and deal with these issues. Um, and there's been no real uh, great example in literature of how you actually properly deal with things such as patient um, reported discrimination. In terms of social capital, so the people in this room and in our department have a significant amount of social capital within UBC, uh, VCH, and systemically broader. And we need people who hold this power and the credibility to advocate for the change of residence. And in our own program, things like the Women in Urology group, and we need other support groups to help find mentors and find unique ways uh, to support our residents as they go through a residency and into a career. And then lastly, at the individual level, so I think it's important to talk about intersectionality here and that recognizing that we all have our own unique experiences with both discrimination, but also with privilege. And it's at my hope that if anything in this presentation, it's given you some insight into the reality of some of our residents and to remind us all that some days are really hard, especially for those who have repetitive discrimination. And it's especially hard for those who intersect at race, gender, medical conditions, and those who identify as LGBTQ. And Individually, I think we can all be self-reflective, ensure we're checking in on each other and recognizing our own privileges and how to take care of others. So really that's the end of my presentation. I wanna thank you all for listening um, and being patient.